Happy Science Week. Welcome to tonight's proceedings. What an honour it is to be gathered in this special place. It's dedicated to the languages and cultures of the First Peoples of Victoria. Science Week is an annual national celebration of all things science. Now in its third decade and as scientific work and expertise become steadily more crucial to the well-being of our people and country, our celebration is becoming more vigorous. Melbourne Museum particularly is very proud to be hosting this public launch event. It is a great honour for us to be doing this and we are thrilled to be working so closely with our very, very valued partners, the Royal Society of Victoria. So it is a great privilege to welcome you here and I look forward to you all celebrating and participating in National Science Week. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch event for National Science Week here in Victoria. We've got a wonderful evening for you talking about science at the extreme. We've got people who have done everything from going to the harshest deserts to the coldest ice fields to the deepest parts of the ocean for you tonight. Before we uh, move on at all, I really think we need to take a moment to uh, welcome Uncle Bill Nicholson to the stage, who's going to welcome us to his country. To feel truly welcome to our sacred land, you must respect people, country and culture. I feel that respect on behalf of my community by be, being invited here to do a welcome to country for you. So I'd like to say, we're Minjika Wallanjeti Bik, Welcome to Wurundjeri country. And, uh, you know, Science Week is going to be one amazing week and I hope it's really successful for you. So thank you. I'm very, very hungry to get National Science Week underway. And so is Victoria's lead scientist, Dr Amanda Cables. So I think we definitely need her to get up onto the stage. Let's get this week started. Science Week is an important festival for Victoria and Australia because it's a festival for everybody. Because science cuts across boundaries, cultural boundaries, gender boundaries, age boundaries, and is the great enabler of thought, new ideas and leadership. And I now declare National Science Week in Victoria officially launched. Happy Science Week. National Science Week, people. Look, some of us have been ready for National Science Week since very, very early this morning, including myself, but not just me. Did anybody manage to watch News Breakfast this morning and see Darlene Lim? She works with NASA Ames. Uh, she goes to the wildest places on Earth, the most extreme places on Earth, to figure out stuff about some of the most extreme places off our Earth. It's incredible science at the extreme that Darlene does, and I would like to invite her to the stage, Dr. Darlene Lim. I work in a, in, a, in a world where I get to work with scientists, with technologists, with operations researchers, with astronauts, with people from a bevy of different social sciences, and we come together because we all have this vision of sending humans back to the moon and then onwards to Mars. And we are truly working on this with gusto and with excitement. Uh, we are living in a very exciting time right now. NASA is aiming to send humans back to the moon in 2024. And then we don't stop there. The idea is to then go forward onwards to Mars. We work in all sorts of environments from pole to pole. We work in deserts, we work in aquatic environments. And in each case, each one of these environments offers us the opportunity to look at the questions, at the problems associated with sending humans back to the moon and onwards to Mars from different angles and to twist and to turn it around and to come at it with a science mind, with an operations mind. And what I do is I try to bring those two worlds together and and, and really look at the problem from a bunch of different angles, but primarily with the motivation of ensuring that science is part of the initial designs and conversations. Our next speaker goes to similar places that Darlene goes to, but she does it not necessarily with a view up and out, but down and in. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kate Selway. Oh. 
ice sheets are melting. These are some of the most extreme places on the planet. The highest, the driest, and the coldest. But obviously it's really important that we understand these places. We need to know how fast the ice sheets are melting and we need to understand how they behave. For me, for my research, I'm looking beneath the ice even deeper into the earth. And I'm interested in the upper mantle. So that's the uppermost few hundred kilometres of the earth. And this is important in the poles because the ice sheets are a huge weight sitting on the surface of the earth. And the earth depresses beneath the ice sheets and bulges out around the sides. It's kind of like a person sitting on a mattress. And when the ice sheets melt, the earth rebounds as that weight is lost. And this is really important because we need to know this to know exactly how much ice is being lost from the ice sheets. The next person we're going to hear from does a very similar thing uh, to Kate. She, she looks down and in, but instead of in through the earth, she looks in through the ocean. Diane Bray. So the Earth's surface is mostly ocean, and the deep sea occupies half of the world's um, oceans. We've only mapped um, very little of it. It's the largest and least known environment on the planet. Life down in those depths, as we go down through the twilight zone, the zone where the light gradually disappears out, in that zone it's uh, filled with bioluminescence, it's filled with fissures with fangs, lots of crustaceans that are red. Red is the new black in the deep sea because as you go down from the surface layers, the long wave length, the, the reds and the violets disappear, so you just retain the blues. So the vast majority of animals in the deep ocean can't see red. As good as, as the three talks we've just heard were, I think we need a bit more. How are we going to regulate our activity in these extreme environments, particularly as we move off the earth, to make sure that we're not repeating the same mistakes we're making on the earth? Uh, I think we're going to make the same mistakes. I don't see us not making the same mistakes, I'll be perfectly honest. I think it would be ridiculous for me to say otherwise. But that's also an opportunity to not necessarily make them in the, in the most unthoughtful way and maybe to catch ourselves sooner and to stop ourselves from making the really bad ones again and again, right? And to be more aware of the fact that we're in this cycle. I wonder, like, part of doing science is observing, and by observing something, you change it. Right? You're drilling holes in hundreds of thousands of year old ice. You're shining light on animals that have never had light shone on them. How much of that is okay, Kate? I know, big question. No notice, <laughs> crack on. Because <laughs> some of it is necessary, right? Do you know what I, what I am going to say is um, that I, I totally agree that, that we're going to make a lot of mistakes and destroy a lot of things. Um, and that's unfortunately just seemingly what humans are like. But that even inadvertently, good can come from that. Diane? Um, certainly in terms of... Of, of collecting and, and finding out what's actually living in the ocean, well, from my perspective, that's really critical. If we don't know what lives there, we don't know how the ecology, how they interact with each other, um, we don't know how to manage them, we don't know um, what effects we're having on biodiversity if we don't know it. Right, so, so what I'm getting is, tread lightly, acknowledge we're going to make mistakes and take advantage of those mistakes when we can, right? That's, I, I, Nailed it, all right. Please uh, make them very welcome and, and, and show your thanks for Darlene, Diane and Kate. <laughs>